Just to please occupy the seats in front. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm JJ Villarreal, and I have the honor of being your moderator for today's Mabini Dialogue. The Foreign Service Institute welcomes you to today's Mabini Dialogue series on examining the Philippines' climate action initiatives in the Indo-Pacific. Before we proceed with our program, please allow me to give a few reminders. We ask everyone to please be mindful of our health and safety protocols. We will be having a question and answer portion after the speaker's presentation, and refreshments will be served at the end of the program. Lastly, please do not forget to fill out the customer satisfaction survey form, which can be, the QR code can be found at the back of your programs. We will also be flashing the QR code at the end of today's Mabini Dialogue. Your feedback is highly appreciated so that we may continue to improve our services and future events. We thank you for your cooperation and attention. Today's Mabini Dialogue seeks to create a conversation on why and how the Philippines can lead the discussion in multilateral fora aimed at climate action and climate, climate change mitigation efforts, especially with the country's upcoming ASEAN chairmanship in 2026. We hope to provide a discussion on efforts we can do to curb the risks of this emerging challenge in the Indo-Pacific region. To formally begin our Mabini Dialogue, May I please call on Assistant Secretary Francisco Noel R. Fernandez III, Director General of the Foreign Service Institute, for his opening remarks. Dean Antonio Lavinia, colleagues in government and in the diplomatic corps, our friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your Foreign Service Institute. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this afternoon's Mabini Dialogue on a topic that affects us all, climate change. While often used as a buzzword, climate change is an existential issue for all of us and an urgent one that needs to be addressed. Climate change affects the Indo-Pacific region more than any other region. The Indo-Pacific bears the brunt of extreme and more frequent changes in weather patterns. Consequently, as one of the Institute's six thematic priorities, our Indo-Pacific study section has included climate change in its agenda in order to sustain discussion on this very important topic and ascertain the role of the Philippines in mitigating its effect. Hence the reason why we are gathered here this afternoon. The Philippines has been active in bringing attention to the impacts of climate change, as it is one of the countries most vulnerable to its effects. The horrific catastrophe resulting from the destructive effect of super typhoon Yolanda or Haiyan, for example, is forever etched in our memory. During my tenure as Philippine representative to meetings of the International Maritime Organization in London, I consistently conveyed reservation on proposals by developed countries promoting ocean fertilization and carbon capture and sequestration in subseabed geological formation as a consequence of this anthropogenic intervention ostensibly to mitigate climate change threatens the marine environment particularly of archipelagic countries like the Philippines. Surely, minimizing anthropogenic carbon dioxide in the atmosphere only to promote ocean acidification does not appear as a reasonable exchange to me. The ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific includes sustainable development goals as one of its four areas of cooperation. Mindful of the importance of working collaboratively and effectively towards improving the quality of life and caring for the planet that sustains it. With the help of our esteemed speaker, Dean Lavinia, I look forward to the conversation which will take place this afternoon. Hopefully, this conversation will provide insights, inform, and more importantly, inspire us all to participate in actions to respond to the threat resulting from climate change which affect our region. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Fernandez. 
And now to further elaborate on today's topic, please allow me to introduce our distinguished speaker for today's Mabini Dialogue. Dean Antonio Tony Lavinia, JSD, is at present Associate Director for Climate Policy and International Relations and concurrently head of the Klima Center of Manila Observatory and a professor of law, philosophy, politics, and governance in several universities in the Philippines. Dean Tony is also a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague, the chair of the Jurisprudence and Legal Philosophy Department of the Philippine Judicial Academy, the founding president of the Movement Against Disinformation, and the founding chair of the Mindanao Climate Justice Resource Facility. He is the former dean of the Ateneo de Manila University School of Government, co-founder of Ashoka Philippines and the Legal Rights and Natural Resources Center, and a former environmental undersecretary of the Philippines. He has been engaged in the climate negotiations for the last 30 years as a head of delegation, lead negotiator, and spokesperson for the Philippines, as a facilitator in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change negotiations, as a technical expert in the Green Climate Fund, then as an academic studying the process, and more recently, as a climate justice activist, working for the maximum outcomes possible in the negotiations. Dean Tony obtained his doctorate and Master of Laws degrees from Yale University and his GD and AB philosophy degrees from the University of the Philippines and Ateneo de Manila, de Manila University, respectively. He placed third in the 1998 bar examinations. Ladies and gentlemen, with a warm round of applause, let us all welcome Dean Tony Lavinia. Thank you for that introduction. Um, thank you, Asak Fernandez, for introducing the topic. Asak Malikar, uh, colleagues from the Department of Foreign Affairs, um, from the Diplomatic Corps, uh, from other government agencies, the media. For my students uh, in my PUP environmental law class, this fell into our schedules. I was supposed to be in PUP, but I asked them instead to come here or to join. Uh, online with incentive points, but I told them you will learn a lot because this is real engagement. Um, of course, I said yes, but I was invited because of the topic, because of the venue, because of uh, Apollinario Mabini. Uh, I'm very honored that this is the second time I'm doing this. The first time was actually almost 10 years ago during the uh, either before or after the Paris Agreement. Uh, I was one of the lead negotiators of the Philippines then, and uh, was a spokesman of the Philippine uh, delegation in, in Paris. Um, and since then, I've continued to follow the process. Uh, but frankly, I've moved from uh, being a government negotiator to technical expert. I work for the Green Climate Fund for a while, and now to a position of advocacy uh, in, in the climate justice space, uh, trying to push for outcomes in the climate negotiations and in the real world uh, that are fair and just for developing countries and for um, the poor. And that includes our region, uh, the Indo-Pacific region, which is I'm asked to, to talk uh, about. But let's just look at some basics. Uh, that's quite uh, important to, to, to know. No, why is it going back? Um, the science of climate change is really quite, quite clear already. Uh, uh, the recent um, report, of course, is the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, when I started working on this issue, which is 30 years ago, we were negotiating the Climate Change Convention, mostly in New York, uh, sometimes in Geneva, and I was actually studying it in Yale when uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Department of DNR asked me to, to help out since I was, uh, I guess at the time, the only Filipino lawyer that was certainly st that was studying the, the, the topic, asked me to to, to join. At the time, uh, when we talked about climate change impacts, we were talking about 30 years, 40 years from now. 
uh, uh, but today it keeps on coming back I don't know why uh, I'm not doing anything I'm just putting the and, uh, just, it's okay I can't just but 30 years ago all of these things were said to happen a hundred years later right but now if you look at these findings we're now talking about climate change impacts now and in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, in 1990, uh, as Sir Fernandez mentioned, uh, Hayan, uh, we thought Hayan was going to happen, but it's going to happen in 2100, not in 2013. So the timeline has accelerated. And so we scientifically, and I work for a scientific organization now, Manila Observatory, we can now say that we are now in the midst of climate change that is accelerating. And that's why we're saying it's an emergency. Um, and the impacts are um, direct, are serious um, on life, on property, on infrastructure, on livelihoods. Um, the most, uh, uh, in fact, it's no longer controversial, the recent terms that have become mainstream uh, just in the last two years is the concept of loss and damage. We couldn't talk about loss and damage 15 years ago because it was, we talked about adaptation 15 years ago. So we were thinking we have time to adapt. Uh, but now we talk about loss and damage that's happening now, and that has to be paid for as a matter of climate justice by those who uh, um, uh, contributed the most to the problem. Our region, the Indo-Pacific, and the Indo-Pacific is a big region, it's Asia, the Pacific Islands, uh, it even includes Australia and, and, uh, and New Zealand, as you know, and I mean, uh, extend all the way to uh, North Asia, uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. So uh, parts of South Asia, at least. Um, the the, the Indo-Pacific will not be spared. We have the biggest coast, the longest coast. Uh, uh, we have many islands, obviously the Pacific Islands. The Philippines, we're not. When we negotiate, I always uh, tell my partners, our partners on the other side, the Philippines is not a small island state, but we are a state of many small islands. And it's very important for us to think like that. And that's why generally we ally with small island states in the negotiations because uh, of that. So the threat is on our cities because all our cities are in the coast. Uh, the threat is also on our small islands. Uh, the threat is on agriculture, on biodiversity. Um, which of course all have impacts, direct impacts on livelihoods. This is an addition, of course, to the disasters that climate brings, the extreme events from big typhoons to droughts, and also uh, even to uh, slow onset events that, that accumulate over, over time. Um, and this is widespread over our, our uh, uh, region. Uh, Different parts of the region have different experiences, uh, but there are commonalities. I mean, um, all our cities are threatened, all our water resources are threatened, all our biodiversity are, are threatened. Some say some might benefit more than others, but not really that much. And that the benefit is also um, uh, counteracted, uh, uh, is also, uh, Compensated is not the right is is uh, uh, taken back by by other uh, disadvantages that climate change brings to some country where they think they might actually benefit because of 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 climate change. Um, so where are we now? Uh, I use this. Um, uh, drawing this illustration. It's actually an illustration I asked a, an artist to do when, uh, I don't know if you were watching that Korean movie about uh, 
the games uh, where I forgot the name now of that Korean series uh, where there was a game of tug of war and I, and I, I like that game of tug of war and uh, you know the the challenge in climate climate change and the climate negotiations is like tug of war it's like a tug of war but everyone loses in the tug of war we kind of need to find a way that neither side lost developing or developed country poor or rich uh, countries time is running out um, the conventional wisdom is that we have only until 2030 so that's six years to change the trajectory of the world meaning to say until 2030 to make sure we don't go above 1.5 degrees, which is uh, still dangerous. Anything above one degree increase of temperature from uh, the pre-industrial era is dangerous. Uh, uh, we're now at 1.2, so what we're seeing is just 1.2. Above 1.5, it becomes very dangerous. Just think of this, above 1.5, Temperatures in places like the Philippines will uh, increase by, not by 1.5 degrees, but four degrees, five degrees, even up to 10 degrees. This, it's been very hot these days, right? I also just came from Singapore, it's even hotter there, but there was Taylor Swift, so it was okay. <laughs> I watched Taylor Swift, but I also went to the doctor. But, uh, uh, but when I landed in the Philippines, it was also really, really hot. It was 42 degrees, like, the other day, no, not, not today, it's not, not, not so hot. Singapore is kind of always cloudy, for those of you who know Singapore, so it, it, the heat can also, but it's still, still really very hot. Just think that uh, by 2050, an increase of five to 10 degrees on terms of the average temperature in Southeast Asia. Um, and what it means for all of us in our daily life. Uh, one point above 1.5 degrees means two or three Haiyans a year uh, in places like the Philippines. It means in El Nino years longer, longer drought um, uh, than what we currently experience. So basically it doubles, triples, whatever already we're experiencing below 1.5. Um, the reason why, if you notice, I said that the, the impacts of failing the goals in the Paris Agreement by 2030 uh, will happen in 2050, because there's a 20-year lag always in climate change. Uh, it's no longer a 50-year, a 100-year lag, but we have to be able to change the trajectory of the global economy so that by 20, 20 years later, we feel the difference. But if by 2030, the world is still business as usual, going to increase, and right now we are going to increase from three to four degrees. That's, even with the Paris Agreement, uh, uh, we're still moving beyond two degrees now. For those who are familiar with the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement um, uh, originally, uh, uh, the agreement, the legal agreement was two degrees. Um, maximum. But the implementation was every country will have to contribute to arrive uh, at that goal of two degrees. The Philippines and uh, many vulnerable countries, we were actually in a group, uh, Climate Vulnerable uh, uh, Forum there, we tried very hard to negotiate 1.5 there. I, I was the negotiator of the Philippines for 1.5 and, and, um, and uh, we did not get it, but we got it as an aspirational number in 2015. We had to settle for that. But just imagine that two years earlier, we, cannot even, we could not even talk about 1.5 in the negotiations because there were some partners, uh, some of our partners, both developed and developing uh, uh, country partners who refused to acknowledge that 1.5 was actually the target, should be the target. 
uh, and still insisted by the time in Paris only at two degrees. But we got them to agree to two degrees, but aspirationally 1.5. But by 2018, three years after the Paris Agreement, after a study was done by IPCC that showed the impacts of 1.5, everyone shifted. So by Glasgow in 2021, after the pandemic, in Sharm al-Sharif, in Egypt, uh, in COP27, and in Dubai, just last November 2028, we, nobody talks about two degrees anymore. We want 1.5. But having said that, we are still not on track for 1.5. We're still on track for more than two degrees, maybe 2.5 to three degrees. Um, in any case, the idea is to increase ambition in the next few years so that by 2030, uh, we are now going to be on the right trajectory uh, and therefore avoid uh, increase of more than 1.5 by 2050, which is what will happen if we fail to do that. So the timeline is very short now. We do not have the luxury that we had when we were negotiating the convention in New York in 1992, and we thought we have 50, 60 years to deal with this problem. Or in Kyoto, I was also, I was the, I was the um, uh, technical lead technical head of delegation, of course, there was a minister, my boss, Secretary of Environment Center Alvarez, the late Senator Alvarez was also there as our co-heads of delegation, but I was the, the, at the time, a USAC in the DNR, and I was the technical head of delegation that was running the negotiations for the Philippines with actually the late Bernaditas Muller from, from DFA, who, was, who is and was the best uh, developing country negotiator. Um, and uh, uh, there we still had the luxury of time. Uh, we were thinking about, well, let's fix this. We have 20 years to do this. Now we don't have those 20 years. We now have only five years. So time is running out. Uh, and so we need to find an approach that works. Uh, in a while, I'll talk about what the Philippines is actually doing to do this. But the approach is what I call an integrated approach of climate, environment, human rights, and peace. Uh, you, you have to see climate as not just a scientific thing or an environmental thing, but in fact as an um, integrated approach to sustainable development issues, to social justice issues, to global inequity uh, issues. So, the first analysis, the first point in that analysis, climate change is a result of injustice between countries, developed and developing, rich and poor, between peoples within countries, again, rich and poor countries, because you know, uh, rich Filipinos contribute uh, emissions more than you know, uh, poor Americans, for example, who do not travel at all, who, who might have jobs that are not really the most, um, uh, the, the best, right? Uh, you have uh, injustice between generations, and you have injustice between species. So uh, when we were negotiating in Paris, I was actually the facilitator of the preamble. It was assigned by the chair of the negotiations to, to, to facilitate the negotiations on, on the preamble, which are the human rights, you know, we couldn't get climate justice in, the term. Uh, it was very hard to get it in, really fought hard. Uh, that was my last negotiation that I did not sleep. After that, my wife said, you can never do that again, not sleep uh, overnight. Um, uh, but we fought hard, and we got into the preamble. But the way, if you look at the preamble of the Paris Agreement, it incorporates climate justice. It incorporates even the term Mother, Mother Earth. But it does so in a way that is not binding, not, not legally binding, right? But like more of a recognition and more, more even like some people recognize, some countries recognize. But now, in Dubai, the, the president of the COP from UAE, you know, has climate justice in all his speeches, you know? So 
We've mainstreamed the term succeeding in, do that, in doing that. Very important to see that climate change results in gross violations of the most basic human rights. The right to life, right? The right to live with dignity, the right to food, the right to livelihoods. Climate change uh, exacerbates conflict between countries um, and within societies, and, and we know that also. Later on, I'll talk about our region, about the West Philippine Sea, and how climate, if we understand it and understand what are the stakes, uh, also raises the stakes in, in the West Philippine Sea as we deal with our uh, giant neighbor in those issues. Um, so climate affects regional as well as international security. Um, and I always say it, it cannot be separated from, from, from peace. Uh, uh, the worst, when people ask me, what's the worst thing that happened in the world in the last two years or the last three years that is worse for climate change? Oh, the answer is very simple. The Ukraine war and the war in Gaza. Why? Because it makes countries of the world very difficult to cooperate on things when th that they should cooperate on because the, these wars bring to the negotiating table um, uh, um, serious obstacles, right? Uh, uh, among the different interests. So that is, you know, for me it's a miracle that we had an agreement and a good agreement in, in COP27 in Al-Sharm and, and in UAE in spite of these two, uh, two wars. But you can see, you can feel the tension. Um, so climate justice, um, getting developing, developed countries to take the lead and to assist developing countries is important. Let me go now to the Philippines, um, understanding our initiatives. Uh, and I want to preface this, and I, I don't say this lightly because I've, I, I can say that I'm the most senior person in the Philippines on climate change. Uh, uh, hold institutional memory because I've worked in and out of government. And even when I'm out of government, I, I get consulted by, by our top um, uh, uh, officials. And I certainly help in building the first, uh, and even the current generation of the climate governance system in the Philippines because I helped write the, the Climate Change Act and other laws. Um, but um, the current crop of officials that we have in the Philippines that are responsible for climate are the best possible officials. Uh, uh, we're very lucky in that respect. Uh, the person in charge for the Philippines uh, is Secretary Tony uh, uh, Yululoy Saga, who actually came from my institution, the Manila Observatory. Uh, but it's very interesting because Tony, we knew Tony, I knew Tony from college uh, days, um, but we've lost touch. Until one day, he actually appeared, she appeared in, in Bonn during, this was COP6, Conference of the Parties number six, and I was still negotiating for the Philippines upon request of Senator Alvarez. And she appeared and she was interested from a business side. And after that, we recruited her and she actually became Executive Director of Manila Observatory for almost 10 years. Um, it was only when it was available to take that position that she left. When she found out it was available, she like resigned right away, Tony take over. So I took over Tony and then uh, she worked with the private sector, the, the Resilience Council, and then now she's um, Secretary of Environment. She knows climate change. She knows the science of climate change. She knows the dynamics. She knows the business sector. And she cares about the poor. Very important for someone who works on climate change. Um, Secretary Popo Lutilia, energy. Energy is very important because our biggest emitter is still energy. And it's the Forestry and energy are lowest hanging fruit in terms of reducing emissions. Uh, and again, I disclose Papa Lutilia is my mentor in UP Law and one of my best friends and continue to be, to be 
that today and he understands that we we need to accelerate the energy transition in the Philippines. He's faced with very difficult challenges because we also have to have security, energy security, we cannot afford. We know that. We, Popo and I were undersecretaries during the Ramos time and we know we cannot afford brownouts, right? Uh, and our industry, our, our businesses cannot afford lack of energy. So, but there's, there's, there's a, uh, a challenge because we have to also ease ourselves away from fossil fuel. And we're now on track to do that for, for coal, thank God, Look, took a while to do that. Uh, I fought that battle for 20 years, but now I can actually say we won against coal. Many of our coal plants will actually be retired even much earlier than when they were built. Um, ironically, they'll make money when they retire it because there's financing to retire uh, coal power plants. Um, but um, uh, the big issue in the Philippines is natural gas. And how it's, it's, uh, it's uh, what they call a transitional fuel. That, uh, but the question is, how long will the transition be? Uh, and the debate is, is there. But I, I, I trust that Secretary Lutilia will do the right thing in the most reasonable way uh, possible. Secretary Solidum of the, the Department of Science and Technology, a disaster person, he's a, he's a geology, he's, a, he's more of a uh, earthquake expert, but he knows climate change. I've worked with him uh, in many occasions and he certainly understands uh, disasters. Uh, he's a scientist, so Pagasa is in good hands with someone like him at, at the highest level. And the Climate Change Commission actually comes from your rank, Secretary Borges. Uh, I, I actually support the idea that a diplomat um, heads the Climate Change Commission because the Climate Change Commission doesn't really have anything, a lot to do in the national, but it's supposed to coordinate policy and then coordinate our um, uh, negotiations uh, together with the DFA um, in, in, uh, in the negotiations, which will, this is like the trade negotiations. Uh, even when both of you retired as a as a Secretary, you, it will still be there like every year. Uh, this is like, this will never end because the climate keeps on changing and we need to keep on responding towards that. So we have the best group of officials, frankly, and I've worked with different set of officials, right? And so for me, if we actually fail in our initiatives now, it's very important to ask why, where, where is the failure? Because it's not gonna be in the, in the political will, which you usually say, or in the competence, because these are competent people, they understand what the problem is, they have the skill. Um, so it's important to understand that. Uh, globally, um, the Philippines asserts leadership in the UNFCCC uh, process, right? Um, under the current administration. Uh, I have to say that uh, in the previous administration, we lost some of our, uh, our um, leverage. Uh, well, it's not a secret to that, that President Duterte did not, you know, was not necessarily the most diplomatic president or was didn't prioritize uh, engagement with his uh, fellow heads of states as much as the current president. Because you, climate at some point has to be at that highest level, given the importance by the, 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 the leader, you know, by, by, by our leader. But we've, we've made up for that in the last two years. I've seen that in person. I've seen new respect. Uh, to be honest, the, the human rights stance of the Philippines in the previous administration was also meant we, we didn't, lots of countries wouldn't listen to us. Uh, uh, when we, you know, you need to have, to be able to assert leadership in the climate negotiations and to be able to call on developed countries on their responsibilities. You have to do it from a high moral ground. Uh, you know, 
both in terms of human rights, also in terms of what you do in terms of uh, addressing the problem. Uh, it doesn't help when you actually say uh, that we are a small emitter, therefore we, will, we don't have to do anything. That doesn't help. Because then, then, then that means we really cannot have a higher moral ground in telling others that you have to increase your ambition. And it's also not true that we are the smallest emitter because we're not. We're actually out of a, out of a number of 200 countries that are members of the convention, parties to the convention. I think it's universal now with the Vatican also uh, a party of the convention. The Philippines is in the top 40. I mean, not 1 to 20, we're 30 to 35, we're 35 to 40. Okay, so we're not, we're not that, uh, we're not at the bottom. Because the bottom are, of course, Pacific Islands, less, least developed countries, African countries. Those are, those are really uh, half of us or one third of us or 10% you know, of our emissions. And our, our emissions will grow. Is definitely going to grow given our economy and given our population. We, I always tell people also when I teach um, constitutional law and talk about inhabitants and, and geography, we, we kind of tend to belittle ourselves, but we're not. We're the number 12, number 13 biggest country in the world, uh, population wise. And if you understand territory as including our seas, our oceans, our exclusive economic zone, we're going to be one of the biggest countries in the world also. Map should be redrawn so that it actually shows your, your, your maritime uh, territory, including your exclusive economic zone. So that's why it's naturally we are not going to be in the, in the lower half or if, you know, we'll have to be in the first one third because of that. Certainly we are not as high an emitter as the US, as China, as as, um, as uh, the European countries, or even as Indonesia. Uh, but in a way, we actually want to be as big as Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore in the sense that that shows the vitality of your economy, right? Um, but global leadership is important. And, and uh, I'll show in a while how we're trying to, to, to do that. Uh, in more specific sense. Regional, and earlier it was mentioned about uh, ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN, within ASEAN, there are many initiatives on, on, on climate. Uh, we have actually something ongoing, uh, working with uh, the ASEAN Secretary at Jakarta and trying to get uh, the ASEAN members to, to figure a way out of how they can negotiate some issues together. We've always failed, so I, I, I probably think we'll fail. Because the, the, there's always this, this notion that ASEAN do not negotiate together in a multilateral setting. And we, we have our other groups, like the group of 77 and, and, and China. There was only one time in these 30 years I've been involved, and that was the Kyoto Protocol, when uh, the ASEAN, all the ASEAN countries agreed that uh, we would say, we do not say ASEAN, but we would say the Philippines and X, X, all the countries agree that we could then mention all the other countries and have a common position uh, on that last long um, plenary session of the Kyoto Protocol. And, but that was kind of unique because there was a Malaysian scientist who was very high up in the, in the negotiations. Uh, and I was there for the Philippines that although I wasn't as, as well-known as a Malaysian scientist, Mr. Chow, Dr. Chow, uh, was known as the, one of the top scientists. But I was also known as someone who knew uh, the legal issues around climate change uh, because that was what I did. It was the book I wrote for my, for my dissertation. So our ASEAN colleagues were very uh, happy to do that. Um, but in any case, there is cooperation that's going on, particularly in in energy, in biodiversity, in forests, and of course in transboundary uh, pollution. Uh, in the Asian Development Bank, there are several initiatives as well that pull not just ASEAN, but also the Indo-Pacific countries together to cooperate 
um, on, on climate change, including their, what I mentioned earlier, the retirement of coal uh, power plants in our countries. Domestic programs are very important because for me, the reason why we had leadership in the global area um, and also in the regional is because we're able to show that in our country, we're able to do certain things that are dynamic, that are innovative, uh, that contribute to solving the problem. So, so we also need to be able to understand that what we do here matters to our partners in the region and to our partners in the global process. For global imperatives, um, science underpins all global, uh, all global negotiations, all global decisions. No? Um, uh, if you know, if you notice, uh, the negotiations accelerate every five years, five to seven years. And that's because every five to seven years, there is a new assessment of the science that is produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's clockwork. So from COP1, we had the first assessment report that informed us. By COP3, Kyoto, we have the second assessment report that informed us. By Bali in 2007, we have the th third or even the fourth assessment report uh, that informed us. And before Sharm, and, and Dubai, we, in the same period, we finally had a six assessment uh, report. The Philippines contributes to that. Uh, I'm very proud that my own organization, Mandila Observatory, has uh, three to five authors of the IPCC reports. Um, and there are others from UPLB, must be also from, the, from PAGASA that also contributes to, you know. Uh, and initially, PAGASA, the directors of PAGASA, Dr. Roman Quintanar, Dr. Leoncio Amadore, were very important players in IPCC. And that's a very important initiative that we continue and we should continue to, to do. So that even before it becomes a political matter, we're able to put our weight in on the scientific understanding of the issue. That's why, that's why 1.5 is now accepted. Uh, as I said, before Paris, like in 2012, 2013, we could not even say it in the floor. But by 2015, we could now say it in the floor and did our best to try to have it accepted. We failed, but it became aspirational. But three years later, 1.5 is now the norm. Uh, and that's because we did the scientific work necessary, and the Philippines contributed uh, uh, to that. Uh, we must, you know, insist on leadership by developed countries, uh, especially the United States and China. I consider China a developed country, to be honest, uh, in this area because of its economy. Um, and uh, we do that generally to the group of 77 and, and, and China. No? When Bernadette Muller from the DFA was um, Alive, you know, even when she was retired, she was still negotiating sometimes for the Philippines. Unfortunately, sometimes, uh, you know, she would not be in our delegation and be in some other developing country delegation. But Bernadette has been replaced by another Filipino who used to work for South Center, uh, uh, Vice U, actually, someone I mentored in the UP College of Law, uh, and Vice, the same thing. But Vice is essentially the the, the, what, the most effective negotiator of the Group 77 in China. And it's just now uh, we were able to arrange last year that Vice would be uh, uh, asked back to negotiate for the Philippines. But he's assigned to, to be with the G77 in China because that's where we can only, we, we, can, we don't have leverage on the US. We don't have leverage on the Europeans. But we have leverage through uh, the group of 77 in China. So that's an investment that we need to make uh, and consider that also an investment for the region. Um, of course, developing countries have a role. I, I'm, I belong to that, that school of thought that uh, uh, 
in fact, we, we should do our share because it's good for us, not because of some kind of global obligation, but also because it's good uh, for us. Climate finance, very important. Uh, climate finance is very um, important. And uh, we've always taken the lead also on that, but we lost that edge during the time of, uh, of Duterte. And it's sad because we actually had uh, Secretary Dominguez leading the, the delegations at that time and taking charge, and he was a finance person. The strong advocacy, but as the Foreign Service uh, people know here, advocacy is not enough in the negotiations. You actually have to know how to negotiate, you know? You have to know how, when the other party says this, you have to have a response, and you have to have a response in terms of tax. And we don't have as much training, uh, and it takes a while to do that. I mean, um, but uh, historically, we've been very influential. Uh, I don't hesitate to say that the Green Climate Fund, which is the, the biggest um, uh, climate fund now, uh, based in South Korea, uh, exists because of the Philippines. And that's pre basically that's Bernadita Muller, who took that work, who took on that work and that burden of negotiating that for uh, from 1996 until we created it in 2010. So 14 years. Uh, and I have to tell you, the first five years there, uh, developing many developing countries didn't, didn't, were not fully supportive because they were afraid that the developed countries would walk out. Because developed countries just really just wanted the World Bank and wanted the global environmental facility, didn't want to create a new fund. Um, that would be under the convention because the problem, as you know, if it's a World Bank fund, and it's not under the convention, then it's the board of the World Bank, which is dominated by, by the, the, the donors to the bank, by the stockholders of the bank. So, so we wanted that. And it was not a popular position. Frankly, even within the government of the Philippines, it wasn't that popular. But Bernaditas really pursued that. And eventually, we, we came along uh, to do that. And by 2010, in Cancun, uh, the Clim Green Climate Fund was created. Um, so we need to do that. There's a new negotiation on climate finance. They call it the new quantified goals. Uh, because we're now wrapping up the implementation of the 2009 Copenhagen climate finance goals of 100 billion a year, which our partners in the developed world have not actually met. But that ends in 2030. So what happens after 2030? Well, we have to have double, triple, quadruple the money because the problem is already here. So I hope the Philippines, uh, I know the first in Egypt, Secretary Yulio Saga was uh, a co-chair of that with, with Jenny Morgan, the, the special envoy of, of Germany, uh, who's a good friend of the Philippines also. Uh, uh, as that accelerates, I hope we, we we take on that role as facilitator, as chair of the negotiations. Loss and damage, it's very hard to say who, 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 who's the author, right? Because we're several authors of the uh, loss and damage. But definitely not the developed countries. They resisted for 30 years, <laughs> certainly since Kyoto, 1996. Because in Kyoto, we were trying to, to get them to agree already to a fund that will pay for damage caused by climate change. It took us until Egypt for the convention to have a consensus to agree on a loss and damage fund. But the Philippines is crucial for that uh, because the idea of a loss and damage fund was first accepted, but very general terms, in 2013, in the Conference of Parties, I think uh, that would have been uh, Paris was 21, Lima's 20. Sorry, <laughs> just do it that way. Lima's 20, uh, I think 19 then, COP19 in Warsaw. Uh, 
what happened in November 2013. Hayan. Loss and damage in real life, diba? Thousands of them. Everything destroyed. Haiyan happened on the eve of the Warsaw Climate Conference. So I was in the delegation also then, and I, w I flew on the day Haiyan happened, the evening. But in the morning, I, was, I had breakfast with Maria Ressa of Rappler, the Nobel Peace Prize winner. We're trying to um, discuss something then. I think it's about, uh, it was about being joining the board of Rappler or something. And then, um, or some other partnership we were, we were striking. And Maria, I remember Maria telling me that, you know, it's so strange that a day after a disaster, we do not have any reports from almost anywhere in the Philippines with the disaster hit. And especially in a city, Tacloban. There were no reports, remember. Haiyan hit on a Friday. On Saturday morning, there were no reports, right? Because people forgot their satellite phones and did not bring the equipment. There were several cabinet members. President Aquino had to send a special team to get there by land so that communications could be reestablished. So I actually didn't know what was happening, so I flew to um, Amsterdam on the way to Warsaw. When I landed in Amsterdam early in the morning, every single television in Schiphol Airport was about the Philippines. And when I got to Moscow, uh, to, to, to Warsaw, 90% of the news was about what happened in Haiyan. Uh, you know, like a 30 minute newscast, 20 minutes is the Philippines on the first week. Right, and when we, when I went to the conference, the parties, everyone was kind of wearing whatever black bands or very, very solicitous of us. And our head of delegation, the opening um, uh, day, Yab Sanyos, who was also my student in UP Law, uh, was delivered a famous speech where he actually cried uh, during the speech because just before he delivered his speech, he saw his brother. Uh, his brother contacted him that he was alive after being missing for, for a couple of, of, of days. And that was the conference where loss and damage was accepted. And we knew it would be accepted because who would not accept the concept of loss and damage, right? After, when you see it in your very eyes, right? But it was just the principle. There was a mechanism created, the WIN, Warsaw International Mechanism on Loss and Damage, but it was like a talk shop, right? Um, it took, so that was 2013. Oh my God, it took another eight years. 2011, uh, eight years, 2021. No, 2022, nine years. Uh, in Sharm al Sharif, when we finally decided to operationalize it. But it, did, it is in the Paris Agreement in 2015 that, that we were able to put the legal concept, the article. There's an article in loss and damage. So that's a very important area because that's the here and now. Um, that's the here and now. I know that the Philippines, as of at least Dubai in November 2023, is trying to get to be the seat of the secretariat of uh, the fund. Uh, it's not going to be a facility like, uh, like the Green Climate Fund, it's going to be an organization. It's going to be the fund. Right now, the interim trustee is the World Bank. But it will have its secretariat. It will report to the convention. So I'm fine. It's not that I'm not against the World Bank. I've worked for the World Bank in different occasions as well in the last 30 years. But, but what's important for me is to whom is it accountable? And this is accountable to uh, the parties to the convention, which makes it, uh, which assures me, comforts me that at least all of us will be heard. Um, there's one last topic here, it's very important to the Philippines globally. It's a topic that's just starting. As an academic, I try to kind of be in advance of, of trying to anticipate, right? And so this is a topic I will tell you it will be the most, once we get loss and damage going, it will be the next most important topic, the biggest agenda 
It's called just transition. Uh, okay, we all agree we have to transition. We all agree that we have to move to a less, um, uh, less emissions, more resilience. But how do we get there? The worst thing is to get the poor countries again, and the poor people in poor countries, like workers, jeepney drivers, to pay the cost of the transition. That's the worst thing. That's why I'm very skeptical about the jeepney transition, and I support it, right? But in paying for it, they're making the sector pay for it, and they're making the drivers and the operators pay for it. Um, and that's not a just transition when you make them do that. And every time, if you notice, every time they try to implement it, there's opposition. And I ask myself, why is there opposition? Well, because every time it happens, they come back with the same plan. You know, so <laughs> same old, same old. So of course you would expect uh, the sector not to, to be skeptical that there you go. We told you that doesn't work. We told you this will put us out of job. Um, you know, the, the, the way the, the plan is, it favors, for example, uh, foreign vehicles, foreign jeepney, you know, things like that. Um, and favors big corporations uh, rather than smaller units. And jeepneys, of course, are smaller units of, of, of uh, uh, smaller corporate units. We know what to do uh, domestically. This is the domestic uh, part now. Adaptation, resolution, mitigation, low carbon economy. We do have to work on limiting development aggression in our country. Uh, mining, reclamation, land use change. Uh, because nature-based solutions are still the best response to climate change. And that's, in the ASEAN, that's kind of all agreed that, because we're in the ASEAN, we're all biodiversity rich, we're all mountain and coastal, uh, so we can use our natural assets, our natural resources to combat climate change. Um, and there's lots of things going on in the region that makes that possible. So priorities here come, capacity building. Of course, uh, communities, families, individuals do matter. I always say that. I talk already about respect for human rights, including you know, the idea of always supporting environmental defenders because they're at the forefront of these things. Uh, domestic peace is important. You know, the peace in Mindanao needs to be maintained and Hopefully, the, the, the new the resumption of the peace process when the NDFP happens. Because, and this is my last uh, uh, point just after these slides. That's, that's my point about uh, trying to actualize climate actions at the local level. What we eat, how we commute, in activities of communities. But my last point, and that's why I talked about peace, is about uh, prioritizing a framework on climate security. Uh, it's not a secret. I monitor it every day, what's happening, what's going to happen, rising tensions in the West Philippine Sea. Disclosure, the Secretary of Defense is one of my good friends, good friend from my UP days, and we, we took the bar together and studied the bar together. And I, But that's not because, that's not the reason why I support him. I support his Actions. I support President Marcos. I propose to support the DFA's actions, which some um, characterize as aggressive, but which I actually think are reasonable in in the way they're dealing with the uh, the West Philippines. So I, I don't have to go to that because you know you know that that's not the topic here. But I do want to say there's an environmental climate and dimension uh, to these uh, tensions. Uh, whether globally, the other thing that's very important for the Philippines that we're part of is the advisory opinion in the International Court of Justice. And, and I know, I think we are preparing also our own brief uh, to be submitted for that, obviously to support it. 
no brainer that developed countries are responsible for loss and damage uh, that we are all experiencing in climate change. I mean, legally speaking, that was my dissertation 30 years um, ago. Um, but within our region as well, uh, we need to understand what is the environmental and climate dimension to this conflict in the West Philippine uh, Sea. Because what our neighbor also has done uh, in their aggressive actions to assert sovereignty over what we consider and what the um, Permanent Court of Arbitration Arbitral Tribunal uh, have ruled as uh, you know, part of our um, uh, uh, exclusive economic zone, if not our national territory uh, itself, has really contravened environmental norms. And I would say has contravened also the climate responsibilities of our big uh, neighbor. So the one thing we have to also think about is what are the diplomatic and legal avenues that could provide openings for us on this issue you know, in terms of engagement with our big neighbor, in terms of getting the support of our other neighbors, of other partners in a diplomatic uh, initiative that we want to do, in legal actions we might take uh, before different bodies. No? Uh, I can't disclose if anything is happening right now until it's actually announced, but, uh, but I think it's very important to, to find that also because as Justice Carpio said when we filed the initial arbitration case, uh, uh, you know, in mid 2010s, uh, what do we have? We really just have the law on our side. We, you know, we, we, you know, we, 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 we don't have a lot of leverage except the law. Although, as Justice as Secretary Chudor is showing now, we we have leverage in the specific areas itself if you have a strong uh, external defense. But that's another story. But um, but we have leverage with the law. I'm, very confident that, that if we see this and deepen this approach of climate and environmental security as part of our geopolitical strategy around the West Philippine Sea, that uh, it will bring us to uh, good outcomes. Thank you. I hope you were provoked. Thank you very much, Dean Tony, for your very informative and insightful presentation. So at this point, we will now be opening the floor for questions or comments. So uh, kindly approach the microphone at the center and please introduce yourself and your office. In the interest of time, please keep your uh, questions concise and up to the point. Yes, please. Um, Dean Tony, good afternoon. I'm Carla from the Foreign Service Institute. I would just like to ask, um, you mentioned that there is a, the projection is actually the emission would go higher for the Philippines. How do we maintain that credibility of being a leader in climate change if the result is that the emission would go higher? Do you think there, um, how do we balance as well our industrialization needs and our climate change commitments? You talked about it in terms of drush transition. Can you elaborate on that further? Thank you. We have to decouple our growth, uh, our economic growth, from our emissions growth. In other words, uh, we should not uh, plan that because we will grow economically, therefore our emissions will also have to grow. Uh, and the, the real the, the, the crux there is of energy. And that's why it's very important that we, the transition to energy accelerate as fast as possible. And the economy of scales are now available for that. Um, I think, in fact, we, we got delayed uh, uh, in, in, in doing that. Uh, but, uh, here's where 
Climate finance is important. So in the Philippines, when we uh, went to Paris, and then when we went to Glasgow, we revised it, but only a little bit. Um, I think we made a mistake, and I've been open even in, in meetings with government <laughs> colleagues about this. Um, we made a mistake by promising to cut emissions, essentially first by 70%, and then in Glasgow, <laughs> I knew the agencies wanted a smaller number, but lo and behold, we got 75% emissions reduction. That's good. But the detail is that 90% of that, or 95% of that, I, you know, 97% of that, of that reduction, we say, will have to be supported by developed countries. You know. And therefore, it's okay for us. In fact, I, I'm privy to the discussion, not with Duterte, but with President Aquino, since I was one of the lead negotiators at the time, we were informed why this was the case, uh, that you know, President Aquino said, uh, we can put a high number because anyway, uh, we're saying we'll only do that if we get the finance, right? Uh, to do that. Therefore, we can still grow, but they have to pay for whatever we need to do to transition to, the, to, to renewable energy, to, to do all of those things aside to reduce emissions. But the problem is that uh, no developed country partner will come and say, okay, we'll pay for 50% of your emission reductions, or even more so, 90% of your emission reductions. You have to be the one, we have to be the one to develop the projects and then tell our partners, these are the projects we want you to finance. And like all projects, you have, there has to be a counterpart. It cannot be totally free, as you know. Um, and that's what's missing for us. Uh, uh, okay, granted that we, we now uh, say that we can reduce emissions, but that those emissions uh, have to be paid, reductions have to be paid for by, by countries, then it's a responsibility to actually develop the projects and the initiatives to get that to, to happen. And, and there's actually still quick, uh, no, no, quick, um, big items, like, like trains, for example, uh, which, can you, which you can use and leverage for, for, for that. Thank you, sir. Any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for sharing with us your insights today. Um, I'm Annika Fulhensho. I'm a researcher with the Foreign Service Institute. As you discuss loss and damages fund, please allow me to ask a question related to migration and human mobility. So when discussing human mobility in relation to climate change, the action seemed to me that it's mostly related to displacement. We already have the Warsaw International Mechanism. It's already included in the scope for damage uh, for loss and damages fund. However, when it comes to um, migration becoming a adaptive strategy for climate change, uh, movement of people uh, within the borders or internationally, I seem to find a bit of a gap in terms of, to, of um, actions or initiatives to address uh, this. Um, could you give us just a little update if there's uh, discussions to address this through the damages fund or are there any other international um, initiatives related to addressing migration as an adaptive strategy for climate change? Thank you. That's, that's a very good question and difficult to answer. It's not a bit of a gap. <laughs> it's, a, it's like a hole, you know? uh, It's like uh, the migration and the related issue of population are like the big holes in, in all of this discussion. Uh, I don't think it's gonna happen in the loss and damage side, because uh, the, the loss and damage side will just look at internal displacement, right? Uh, and how you, in fact, the, the strategy for loss and damage is you not to move people, but how to rebuild uh, settlements and rebuild them in a safer way. But you know where that's gonna happen in the climate space? That's gonna happen in the just, that's why I'm saying the big, the big, next big agenda in, in climate change 
is just transition. Because that really is a just transition uh, issue. Uh, you know, never mind displacement of in a big country like the Philippines where you can move people around, but how about small island states where, right, that lose a lot of territory that can no longer contain the people, where, where, where do you move them? That has to be a migration issue. Um, I don't think we can escape that. As we also, it's, these are all, all, all interconnected, right? Below 1.5, we might be able to manage. Uh, but above 1.5, especially above 2, 2.5, you will lose whole islands uh, where there's no other option. Uh, I guess in the Philippines, you can still locate people in the bigger islands, right? Uh, we will lose many of our small islands also. That are all, many of them are habitat, right? We, we make a mistake of thinking that uh, uh, I, I think even that notion that we have what, 7,100 plus islands and that only 1,000 islands or 2,000 islands are happy. I, I think that's not, there's no census to actually say that. Uh, my own personal experience, almost everywhere I go, there's someone there. Uh, there's some village, there's some, you know, even in protected areas which is where, where there's supposed to be nobody, right? Uh, you, you will always almost see someone. I mean, that, that's a, the experience of the Philippines. If you were an environmental official like me, and at the time we had a very good helicopter that was just bought from France and for forest fires, so, and I wanted to see the Philippines and, and to solve things, right? And so my secretary would say, oh, you're young, you can go uh, use the helicopter to go wherever you want to go to see what the problem, and in the Philippines, like everywhere, you see someone and something. Very different if you went to Australia, for example, where you can go for hours and you only see sheep, right? Uh, but but uh, sorry for the Australians, but uh, uh, I also went to Australia during the time, and I could just see the contrast in 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 the two countries in terms of population. <coughs> Uh, we have time for only one more question. Yes, ma'am, at the back. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Isabella Patricia Noble from the Lyceum of the Philippines University. Um, so first of all, I would just like to thank you for um, addressing the, clim uh, the need for climate action, especially on the part um, where we need to touch more upon the climate injustice. Um, so with that, I would just like to ask, what would you say is um, more of the impact of climate injustice, not only to Philippine individuals, but also to the um, small island nations? Um, is injustice increasing because climate change is also increasing? Thank you. Yeah, there's a direct proportion of that. Because the front lines of climate change are, uh, as I said, the small islands, including our small islands even if we're not a small island state. It's indigenous peoples in the mountains and in the coast uh, because they are the first to experience climate change. Uh, and the irony of it, right, is that it's these peoples and these islands that have contributed the least to climate change. Uh, but they're the most unprepared for, for climate change. Um, Sometimes it hits a city like Tacloban and you can see that climate change is that big equalizer, rich or poor, you know, you get affected. But if you survive in Tacloban the first day and you were rich, you simply moved to Cebu or to Manila uh, as soon as you could, right? Uh, but if you were poor and had no other option, middle class, they didn't have options. so. So yes, the, the, the more climate change accelerates, the more injustice that we see. And that's why we want the International Court of Justice to, to come up with a very strong statement. Uh, we think that if that statement, that it's a bit for advisory, so non-binding, but if that statement comes out, it will reverberate on the negotiations. And we can accelerate, for example, loss and damage. Uh, uh, 
no doubt about it, loss and damage is like a tooth extracted from our developed country partners. They would rather not have it. To be honest, I was there. I was, you know, close in. Uh, you know, they would rather not have it. Uh, they have their reasons. You know, why another fund? Uh, and in fact, in fact, you know, the the game here is you just move one set of funds to this other fund. I mean, and so you also have to be vigilant that it's new and additional funding, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a big thing because before our developed country partners refused to address as a legal obligation climate loss and damage. They will address it, by the way, but through humanitarian, you know, out of a moral, of, like when, when Haiyan happened, we thank our partners from all over the world, developed countries, developing countries, like China sent people, U.S. certainly, the Europeans, they all, Australians, they all came to, to help. But they did not do that as a matter of legal obligation because of climate. They did that as part of their humanitarian moral obligation. But with the loss and damage concept, what we're saying is that loss and damage is because of actions that resulted in loss and damage. And that's an entirely different thing. But if you want to be more complicated and the lost you, that's it, we will do something like that in our class. Uh, as I said, it's like extracting a tooth from, the, from our partners, right? So in Paris, they extracted a smaller tooth from us, from the developing countries, which is that loss and damage is not about liability. And they said, we'll only agree to a loss and damage article in the Paris Agreement if you agree in a decision that adopts the, 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 the Paris Agreement that this is not a matter of liability of anyone. And when I was asked by our delegation, I said, we have no choice. We, we, should, we, can, we accept that because we want the article. Anyway, it's a decision. And the decision can be changed every year, you know, by consent, of course, by consensus. Uh, but you, with political pressure, you can, you can change that. An article of a binding agreement that is ratified and deposited in the United Nations, you know, cannot be changed unless there's an amendment to that agreement. So there's a difference. Sorry for confusing you about that, but that for the, the, just to show you that this is dynamic. And, and we've made, maybe I conclude, we've made progress. I, in 30 years, I've seen a lot of progress. But I'm also telling you that we are not making the progress as fast as we need to, and we're running out of because in 1990, we had 50, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. We had that window. I always tell people, I, 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 I've done the studies for this. If we only did in the, in the 1992 convention what the developing countries wanted, which was that developed countries limit their emissions, stabilize their emissions, by 2000 to 1990 levels, we won't have this situation now. And then in the Kyoto Protocol, we wanted 30% reductions by developed countries. They gave us only 5%. And that has not even been implemented because as you know, the US pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol. So you, you, you can see that progress is made, but it's very slow, but the problem doesn't wait for political processes to, to make progress. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Tony. I believe we have one final question from the floor from Sir De La Vega. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam MC, for accommodating the question. Good afternoon, Dean Tony. My name is Jahaira from the DFA. Hi. Sir, I just wanted to ask you, uh, what are your views on the suggestion to develop or explore the use of nuclear energy as a source of clean energy to support the just transition to a zero carbon economy? Thank you, sir. Uh, since I work for a scientific organization, I anticipated that question. It's always asked nowadays. So I made sure my organization, the Manila Observatory, it's, it's the 
it's the oldest scientific institution in the Philippines. Well, maybe USD probably had older, you know, but it's a Jesuit institution. Uh, Padre Faura is named after the founder of Manila Observatory, not after a lawyer. Uh, because Manila Observatory was uh, uh, where um, um, Robinson's Ermita is now. That's where Manila Observatory used to be. So there's actually a marker there. And, uh, but we're, we're uh, mostly a group of scientists, like 30 scientists. I brought in around 10 lawyers now that work with us to do climate mitigation, but, but uh, we're mostly scientists. So I asked my scientists, what, what's your view on this? Uh, so from a climate point of view, of course, nuclear is better than, certainly than LNG. No? Um, the big issue of nuclear is still the unresolved issue of waste and safety. Those, those are two separate things. Um, there's talk, there's literature. Uh, I don't know how advanced it is that you can now have uh, nuclear plants that are the, the latest nuclear plants uh, uh, are able to solve both of these issues. They're smaller, they're modular, et cetera. So we would have to make sure that that's the case. Um, but in that case, if they're smaller, it doesn't have the same attraction that the big nuclear plants is. Well, the big nuclear plants, kasi, you can just have one big nuclear plant in Luzon and can cover most of the grid needs of Luzon, and the rest can be covered by renewable. But if it's just going to be smaller units, then it's just like solar facilities. What, then why, why go nuclear and, and not just use solar or wind or or the safer ones, right? So, so that, that's, that's the, the question there. Um, but my, our scientists say that the two things we have to be sure of is uh, waste, if it still, if there, it still generates waste, where, where do we put it? Um, and then safety. Uh, I don't buy the notion that Filipinos, that Filipino scientists can, cannot run uh, nuclear plant safely, because we do that all over the world. There's lots of Filipinos in nuclear facilities already all over the world. And we can train our people. Actually, the, the uh, Bataan nuclear facility, nuclear plant, people were, BNPP were really being trained for 10 years before that, right? It, of course, you have to have a long period of time. You, you're not going to see a nuclear power plant in the Philippines for another 10 years, because you have to train people, you have to train regulators, there's a lot of training that has to do that disappeared when we we after the Marcos um, after EDSA when it was kind of a bad word to 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 pursue nuclear energy. Um, the safety issue is more, uh, and we see that in Japan, a very advanced country like Japan, the safety issue is more: can you evacuate people in overnight? Can you? Can you, where do you move people if you need to move people out of harm's way if there's an accident? You have to assume that accidents happen in, in nuclear you know, facilities, so, uh, so what do you do when you, when you do that? So those are the hard questions that have to be, that have to be uh, asked. No? But my sense uh, is, uh, so it's not like on the top of, our agenda yet, our sense is that that's not going to happen for another five to ten years. In the meantime, we should really be investing in the technology, in the development of people in the technology. Because uh, we cannot even think of that option if we do not have nuclear scientists. You have to have nuclear scientists, and you have to have them in the dozens of you know. You have to have nuclear nuclear technicians. These are these are the, the, the most high risk jobs, right? Um, and I, what I've seen is all this talk in the last ten years have been in some of those talks, especially about energy, and it's always we say that we have to do this, but I don't see the nuclear en engineers being trained anywhere in the Philippines. I, I don't know if you, you can tell me, but I don't see uh, a cohort of people. 
that are being trained in the, in the field. And I know it will take, and that includes regulators, by the way, because extreme regulation is necessary. Very serious regulation is necessary in the approval of uh, approval and then the, the oversight of, of nuclear facilities. Thank you, Dean Tony. So in the interest of time, we will now be closing our question and answer portion. Thank you, everyone, for your active participation. So as we draw our program to a close, uh, Dean Tony, perhaps you'd like to share a few final words to our audience. Again, I thank you for this chance to um, to be in the Malbini lectures. Uh, among our scientists, uh, uh, oh, sorry, among our heroes, that's right. Uh, Malbini obviously was my number one fan because he's the lawyer among the, among the, the national heroes, the founders of the republic, right? I mean, Rizal was many things, doctor, writer, inventor, uh, Bonifacio was the organizer, leader, revolutionary, but uh, Mabini was the thinker and also the legal thinker, political and the legal thinker. And, and we know that he th was one step, two step, three steps ahead of everyone else um, in thinking through uh, what we are faced with, including our foreign policy. And that's why you honor him here in the department. And I am here, I always take a selfie of him with me and him and say, you know, and, and, and you know, it's, it's good for the department to remember that, that uh, we had someone more than, you know, 100 years ago that actually thought far ahead of everyone. And climate is about that. It's about thinking ahead of our, of what we see around us um, and what I hope we had today is, is an example of how we could think uh, ahead so that see climate is accelerating 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 you cannot address it just by following it following the pace you have to run ahead of it and catch it before it jumps again exponentially to a new stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And now I would like to invite Assistant Secretary Francisco Noel R. Fernandez III, Director General of the Foreign Service Institute, to award a certificate of appreciation to our esteemed speaker. Allow me please to read the citation. So the Foreign Service Institute, Department of Foreign Affairs, awards the Certificate of Appreciation to Dean Antonio G.M. Lavinia, JSD, for his invaluable service as speaker at the Mabini Dialogue Series examining the Philippines Climate Action Initiatives given this 11th day of March 2024 at the Foreign Service Institute. Once again, I would like to thank our speaker, Dean Tony Lavinia, for taking the time and sharing his expertise with us. We kindly ask you to take a few minutes to answer our customer satisfaction survey. Again, the QR code can be found at the back of your programs. So ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our program for today. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you in our future events. Have a good day.